Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Welcome to Romans part 32. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for that access, thankful for your grace, for your love, your mercy, your goodness. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness with seal to our hearts, only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together, uh, if you've been following us in this video series in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had just reached the beginning of verse 17 of chapter 5. Romans 5, verse 17. The Holy Spirit has clearly revealed the total depravity of man and then the wonders of God's grace. And we're now looking in great detail at what God accomplished on the cross on behalf of those whom he redeemed. But as you'll see in this video, there's a little more to it than that. In our last study together, we looked at uh, verse 15 and 16. If through the offense of the one, and it's a first class condition, and the nouns, as I pointed out to you in the, in the last video, most of the nouns here end in mu alpha, which basically says that we are stressing the result of the action, not just the action. And that really does become important in our present study. So we begin in, in verse 17. If for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And again, it's a first class condition. Since by one man's offense the death reigned by one, and it did. In a much greater way, death reigned through Adam, but in a much greater way, we that receive the abundance of grace and gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The reign is not in our strength. It's not in our ability. It is clearly stated in the text that it is by means of Jesus Christ. The word is dia, by means of or through Jesus Christ. One of the great uh, preaching efforts of the last generation has been the Lordship Salvation Group, where that so much responsibility is put on you. The reason we reign in life is by means of Jesus Christ, not by the way we live, not by the choices that we make, but by means of Jesus Christ. This is what the text is saying. Because he's the center of our life. He is the reason for our life in a much greater way. We receive the grace of God and the gift of righteousness. This gift of righteousness is not, it's not something that's offered, but it is something that we have. The emphasis of the text and the, the inference of the text is not that he offered you righteousness and you have, you have the option to receive it or not to receive it, but that you have received. The gift of righteousness. It's what you've been given and the abundance of grace. I pointed out in, a, in an earlier video that you couldn't spend it all up. The grace of God is the sphere in which we live. It's where we breathe. It's where we move. It's where we have our being. Therefore, having been justified by the faithfulness of Christ, 
we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. It doesn't say wherein we should stand. It doesn't say wherein we might stand. It doesn't say that you could you could stand in grace if you wanted to. What it says, what the text says, is it says you do stand in the grace of God. You have no other standing. I am persuaded, as most of you know, that much of modern Christianity wants us to believe that we stand in our own strength, our own willingness to obey, to receive, to believe, and on and on and on and on it goes in the area of Christian response, not in the purpose and the finished work of Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, I am in no way suggesting that there is not a responsibility that comes by virtue of sonship. We're God's children, and, and as God's children, we have, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility not to lie to one another. We have a responsibility to walk e equal to the position that we have in Christ. We have a responsibility to love one another from a pure heart, fervently. But our text, our text is talking about the finished work of Jesus Christ and its result in our life. We do stand in the grace of God. If you try to stand in your own strength, it will be a miserable failure. I don't meet hardly any Christians who rejoice in the fact that God does not see you as a sinner. God sees you as righteous in Christ. We know that we live a life that it, that has that's displeasing to ourselves, let alone to the Lord. Every great theologian that I know of has written laid in his life concerning the, the terribleness of his own physical life and his own personal sin, and yet rejoices in the realization that by means of Jesus Christ, through Christ, we stand before him without spot and without blemish. Now, we'll look more at that, Lord willing, if, if he tarries. When we reach the seventh chapter, we stand in the grace of God. We've received an abundance of grace, more than sufficient grace, and we are righteous. Verse 18, therefore, as a result of all this, as by the offense of one, the judgment came upon all men to condemnation. The word condemnation there, katakrina, it ends in mu'alpha. That means it's stressing the result of that action, not the possibility of it, or, or not just pointing out the action, but the result of it. They, all men, were condemned by one man's sin. Therefore, as by the offense of the one, and, and without question, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And it's a completed action. It isn't that they stand in judgment and, and will judge and see whether or not they ought to be condemned. You know, we'll... we'll will weigh their good deeds against their bad deeds and decide whether or not they're guilty or innocent. That's not what the text says. It says, in fact, that the judgment was to condemnation. It's a completed fact. 
condemned. But even so, by the righteousness of the one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And now, now we have a problem. We have a problem. And, and we have a problem that is discussed in great detail in, in most literature that you read. Most commentaries, articles, pamphlets, you name it. And one of the problems of following this ministry is you listen to what I teach, but what I teach may or may not be truth. I do not want to give the opinion that truth isn't truth. What I am willing to admit is that what is preached here is open to investigation. You should study the scriptures seriously to see whether or not these things be so. As long as we both realize that, that truth is, is this book and truth is not what we would like it to be, then I, I believe that we'll always get along fine. Truth is not what my logic says it ought to be, but truth is the word of God. And we are studying together the infallible, inerrant word of the sovereign God. Wherein my approach to scripture may differ from yours. One of us may be right, Neither one of us may be right. I don't know. I, I study carefully. And I study as diligently as I know how to reach the conclusions that are presented here. It is up to you to decide, as a Berean, a noble Berean, to search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be, be, be so, be true. Now, what the text says, if you have the authorized version, you, you, you actually see a, a bunch of inserted verbs because, well, because there are no verbs in this text. And for those of you who've studied the Greek language, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful verse because the verse emphasizes tremendously the truth that it's putting forth. And that truth is that one man brought absolute condemnation to all. And another man brought absolute justification to all. And the problem in the verse is the all. Now, there are many solutions to that. I'm sure you've heard, uh, those of you at least who have been listening to me for a while, heard me comment. I'm sure you've heard me on, on a, at least one occasion that all, the word all, is limited by the text. And that's always true. All never means all. And I said that once to somebody and they stomped off and I didn't really have a chance to explain any further. But it never does. It never, all never means, always means all. For example, let me just throw this out there. If I said to you that, that I'm going to run for president of the United States and I have one major plank in my platform, and that is that all families have a minimum income of $100,000 a year. Nobody would conclude that, that I had just said, I want George Washington's family, Abraham Lincoln's family, and uh, I want my great, 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 great grandfather's family to have an income of $100,000.
you wouldn't do it. None of you would conclude that I meant everybody, everybody in Europe, everybody in Canada, uh, everybody in Mexico, everybody in South America. I don't have to say it. The context would limit my use of the word all, and that is true in every case. So you have to study carefully when you look at the word all in the scriptures. This is something that I learned many, many years ago. Now, there are several ways all occurs here, and it's all men. So we could say we've limited it to men, not to women. Well, the problem is we can't do that with, with anthropos. We'd have to say all humans. So in this particular text, we'd say that all is limited to humans, not to chickens, ducks, cows, horses, mice, or, or anything else. But it is all humans. Now we have a problem with that. If you're a strong Calvinist and you follow Brother Calvin, then you would conclude that the all here means all classes of people. All classes of people. So there's no distinction. God is no respecter of persons. Those uh, who were condemned include kings, wealthy uh, servants, the poor, the sick, the well. And so we would say, that by Adam's sin, all classes of people were condemned, and all classes of people were justified. And we would say that it doesn't mean every man that ever lived. So we would have to say that, that if we do that, the text is not saying, it is not saying that Adam's sin affected every man it just affected all classes of men it's a problem you're all familiar i'm sure most of you are probably familiar with a verse in timothy that the holy spirit has paul urge prayers for all men for kings for those in authority and god has determined god has willed that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. And one of the great ways around that verse is that, well, it, what it means is it's, it's talking about all classes, you know, kings down through servants. They'll all come to a knowledge of the truth. One, of course, could take the verse at face value. I believe the day will come when all will come to a knowledge of the truth. I don't have any, any problem, any trouble with that verse at all. But a lot of people seem to have trouble with that verse. I'm going to suggest that I don't believe all classes of men works for us here in verse 18 of Romans 5. Because I believe that what Adam did had a universal effect. For by one man, sin entered the world system and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Once again, we could just say that that's just all classes of men. It doesn't mean it every man. And I don't think that you can do that with Adam's transgression. You know, if, if you can with, with peace in your heart, that's fine. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. 
I believe that as the federal head of the race, as the representative of the human race, when Adam sinned, all sinned, no exception, they all sinned. And the wages of sin is death. So they all died. And I think that the clear testimony of Scripture is that every man died in Adam. Now that means that means that if we just simply take that at face value, that nobody has to commit any sin to go to hell. He's already dead spiritually. He's already dead in Adam. And it is foolish to talk about the soul that sinneth, it shall die, unless by that sin you mean the sin that was committed in the federal head, Adam. For all sinned, the scriptures say. You cannot tell me you did not sin in Adam. Because God says you did. And I, ne I never try to argue with God. Therefore, I had death by Adam's sin, but it is impossible, at least in my mind, it may not be in yours, to speak of something dead that never had life. That didn't have life first. Clearly, if we were in Adam as our federal head, we were there alive. We can't look at any earthly creature and say it's dead without inferring <coughs> that there was a time when it wasn't dead. Oh, Steve, I don't remember that. Well, you don't remember being crucified with him either. Folks, nothing that's dead can be said to be alive if it didn't have life to begin with. So when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he breathed into Adam and into all who are represented in Adam that breath of life. And when Adam sinned, they all died. So spiritual death passed upon all men. Now, I want to take some time. I rarely do this. Just to go through some verses. Let's go back to the Gospel of John. Okay, I, I want you to go to John chapter 1, verse 9. You may even know that verse. John 1, 9. This was the true light that lights every man that cometh into the world. Well, that verse is a great verse for the Armenian. If you've ever heard of someone talk about a, a spark of light that's in every human, and then you can just fan that little fire, you know, by preaching the gospel, and they may or may not exercise their free will to accept what you are preaching. And they get that from this verse. They get that from this verse. And you can't say to an Armenian who believes that every man, uh, well, that it, you can't say to an Armenian that doesn't believe in total depravity. You know, he's not totally depraved. He's not. He, he has some little light in him that if he hears the gospel and he responds to the gospel, then he'll be redeemed. And he can do that. He can do that because there's a little flicker of light in him. That's basically, that's the Arminian theology. That's the Arminian position. Now, don't argue with them that they didn't get that out of the Bible. This is the verse that they use. Admittedly, they ignore all. It's interesting. I just used the word all. All of the verses on total depravity. 
and they build a theology on a few isolated verses. I've been criticized uh, many, many times over the years that that I build a theology on very few verses. I don't see or I don't see that to be the case at all. If I do, I apologize. I don't try to do that. I list down a verse and I list what I think it means, and then every time I find something that that seems to contradict that doesn't jive with that meaning then i write it on the other side of the page and my responsibility in life as far as i'm concerned is before i die and it's looking now like you know i may not make it but before i die i want to i want to list the meaning of a verse for which i have no contradictory verses. And that's the way that I study. A lot of Christians will take and read one verse, believe it, read the next verse that cancels out the verse that they read before it. I'm not going to build a position of, uh, on total depravity that doesn't fit with other verses. Here's one. And there are many. And people will say to me, now, wait a minute, Steve, wait a minute. You talk about no man can come unto me except my father, which is in heaven, forces him to come. What about this verse? Christ lights every, enlightens, he lights every man that cometh into the world. Do you believe that? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that, absolutely. There are hordes of Christians who believe in what we call a universal atonement. And there are hordes of Christians, and, and I don't mean this in any, any way to be you know derogatory, who believe in what is known as limited atonement. I happen to believe they're both in the scriptures, which is why there are people who believe that. There are people that believe in one or the other. The problem is those who believe in limited atonement, well, they really, they don't want to have anything to do with those who believe in unlimited atonement and vice versa. And what I'm telling you folks is I believe they're both there. I think what Jesus Christ came to do and did on the cross was to remove that blight from Adam's transgression. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in the 18th verse of the fifth chapter of Romans. How did he light every man that comes into the world? Did he put some, some little spark of light in there that, that if they, they just fan it properly, they'll respond to the gospel? That is not the way light is ever used in the word of God. That verse doesn't say that he put a little light in them. He put a little tiny flame in there that, that needs to be fanned or preached to. He doesn't say that. It says he lighted them, and light is used of righteousness. Light is used of God. In him is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I believe that Jesus Christ removed the blight of the results, the consequences of Adam's transgression for every man, all men. 
I don't believe there is one single human any place who has ever lived who can claim to God that he's going to hell because Adam sinned. Now, I have not been silent as to how I believe this addresses children who die as well as children who will be raptured. No child in hell, no child left behind. And that is because Christ universally removed the transgression of Adam by his death. Let's go to John 6.33. I want you to turn, please, with me to John 6.33. The very chapter in which no man can come unto me except the Father, which is in heaven, drags him or forces him. In verse 33. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Sin entered the world by one man. Light entered the world by one man. Let's go on. Let's look at the 12th verse of the 5th chapter of Romans. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by the one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all sinned. I think that's every man. I don't think that's all classes of man. Now we're told in the 18th verse, verse 18, that the gift of righteousness came upon all men. The condemnation was there. The condemnation was removed for all men. Let's go, let's go on. Let's go to the seventh chapter, if you would. Please turn to the seventh chapter of Romans, the ninth verse. This is going to make sense. I really do believe it will. Romans, the ninth verse, 7 9. For I was alive, separate from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So, so. Here was Paul, redeemed on the road to Damascus, a new creation in Christ. He got his sight back when he was there with, uh, with uh, Ananias. And he went on into Damascus. And then that night, he walked by a strip club and some belly dancer, scantily dressed, came out. Paul lusted after her and he died. I've read commentaries that have said that. And I think, you got to be kidding. That means that he must have died a hundred million times. Okay, all right, I exaggerated. 10,000 times. If you tell me that there was no lust in Paul's life, I will 100% disagree with you. Are you saying that every time that I sin, I die? Is that the biblical approach to this verse. Now, I don't want to take an, an isolated verse, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to have a lot of fun when we get to Romans 7, Lord willing. Fabulous chapter. How could Paul have been alive separate from the law if he died in Adam? How could he say he was alive? Now, this is the word of the Holy Spirit. This isn't, this isn't Paul's logic, Paul's reasoning. If Paul was alive, separate from the law, he was alive because whatever happened to him in Adam had been taken care of. And now when he sinned, he died. So he was alive. He died in Adam. He sinned, and he's dead in his sin. So he's twice dead. Sound familiar? Twice dead. And he needs to be born again, which he was. 
He needs to have life again, which he has writing this. Let's go on. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4. Let's go there. 1 Timothy 4. I've got so many verses here. We're not really going to have time to look at, at all of them. 1 Timothy chapter 4, the 10th verse. Verse 10. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Wow. The all men could be all classes of men, kings, servants, rich, poor, black, white, yellow, red, whatever, whatever. Or, folks, why is the verse that way? Why is, is he the particular savior of those that believe and a universal savior of all? I'll tell you why. Because he removed Adam's transgression for all, and he brought us into the abundance of grace, those who believe in Christ. And who are those who believe? His sheep. And who are his sheep? Those who were born again by God from above. Those who are given life from above. Let's go a little bit further to Hebrews. Chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, the ninth verse, verse 9. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man every man once again the easy way out and it may be the right way is that is that's talking about every class of man not every single man and you have the same problem in context with the word every that you have with all it's it's the same word in the greek Every man. How did he taste death for every man? He removed the death that entered the world through Adam, as far as I'm concerned. Look, if you will, at 1 Peter 1, the third verse, 1 Peter 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Now, I admit that you are surrounded by many, many Christians who are ones who call themselves Christians, who believe that you're saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. So you keep being born again, born again, born again, born again, born again, and born again. And that, my friends, that is a blasphemy of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because Christ died unto sin once, and that's it. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God, having been justified by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God, and access by that faithfulness into the grace wherein we stand. It's not an in and out and in and out. How then are we begotten a second time? Isn't that what he said to Nicodemus? You must be.
be born a second time or you must be born from above. One of the classic verses, and we know man is born of the water and of the spirit, the word of God and the spirit of God. That's two births. And you were born a second time. He has begotten us a second time unto a living hope. And unless you believe that people can be saved and lost or, or redeemed and lost, redeemed and lost, redeemed and lost, if you believe in the eternal security of the believer, which I do without question, I believe that, the Holy Spirit once again infers that I have been born a second time, and I believe I have. Let's look at 1 Peter 2.25. You turn there with me, 1 Peter 2.25. For you are a sheep going astray, but are returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. Is that a rededication service? How were you a sheep? Because you were born in Christ. You sinned, you went astray, and now you have returned to the bishop and shepherd of your soul. That's two births. Let's go to 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying, get this, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now you have two possibilities. You have the possibility that these are redeemed people who are not acting like redeemed people. And, and God is going to uh, bring, he's going to bring upon them destruction, but, but they'll wind up in heaven. That's, that's one possibility in the verse. The other and the more likely possibility is that Jesus Christ did something for them in removing Adam's transgression and they deny the very Lord that bought them. That's up to you. You have to handle that verse. Go to Jude. Go to Jude in the 12th verse of Jude, Jude 12. These are spots in your feasts of love when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither as without fruit, twice dead. Twice dead. Now I can pull up many in a commentary out of a study or, or an article on that verse, which says they're dead spiritually and they're dead physically. Well, I mean, they could hardly be dead physically if they're worshiping in your feast of love. So that doesn't make any sense. The next possibility is that when it says that they're twice dead, well, what that really means, Steve, is <clears throat> they're really dead. I mean, I mean, these people are, are, are dead people. Let me tell you, they're really, really dead. But I can't do that with the language either.
I, I believe, folks, that you are twice dead people who are twice alive people. That's what I believe. These are twice dead people who are only once alive, and that is the second death. You are preserved or delivered from the second death because of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. These are not. I don't think there's any physical possibility in the 12th verse. Physical death doesn't enter in. They died in Adam. They died in their sin. They're twice dead. They are spots in the feast of love. They're not God's people. We died in Adam and died in our sin and were made alive in Christ. Look at Revelation 3, 5. Turn to Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Will not blot his name out. Well, now, look, you either believe in the eternal security of the redeemed, or you don't. And you cannot argue with the Arminian who sees in this verse, look, look, you may think you're going to heaven, but uh, you could be blotted out. Because it says if you don't overcome, you'll be blotted out of the book of life. Do we infer from this verse nobody's ever blotted out? That, that would be a strong Calvinist position. But that doesn't make sense with the text. Now, folks, there are some things I find really difficult to comprehend. But this is not one of them. The truth is that there are two books the book of life that everyone's name is written into who was born and made alive through the one man, Jesus Christ, and the Lamb's book of life, which no, no one written into can be blotted out of. He will not lose one. All the Father gave me, I will not lose one. The lost are blotted out of the book of life as though they were never born. Spend a moment trying to wrap your mind around that. They were never written into the Lamb's book of life. Do we infer from this verse that depending on how we live, we may or may not be in the book of life? Our name was there. Obviously, how did it get there? Well, you accepted Christ. You, you went down the sawdust trail. That's how your name got there. But boy, I'm telling you, if you don't live right, it'll be blotted out. That's the Armenian position. That's the comforting Armenian position. The correct position is that life was given in Christ. As death came through Adam, life came through Christ. The book of the living is not the book of the redeemed. A person's name is blotted out if he's not an overcomer. And now we've got a thousand sermons on overcoming. And what does the text say? Folks, what does your Bible say? that you're holding in your hand say. It says, who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. You didn't, you didn't overcome by anything you did. You overcame 
because you're one of God's sheep and as one of God's sheep, you believe. Don't, don't take that fifth verse as you got to do something or your redemption is in jeopardy. Last of all, I want you to go to the 20th chapter, the 14th verse. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Your possibilities, of course, are that the first death was physical and the second death is spiritual. I do not think that will fit with the body of Scripture. Again, they died in Adam, and then they died in their own sin. And the result is the second death. But, since your second birth, since you were born again, since you're born from above, by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, the second death has no power over you. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you once again for just the time you've given us just to think about your word. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness, would seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for watching.